The next chapter has to do with the all-important topic of crisis communication, which is such an important part of what public relations practitioners and any type of organiza organization are faced with today. Um, it's, there's example after example, and the textbook lists some of moments in organizational history where a company has literally um, floundered. Uh, because of not being able to handle a crisis effectively in terms of the communications, in terms of dealing with the issues, in terms of managing the impact that the crisis had on the had on the organization, and some of the great ones out there include the uh, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which today remains a case study of how not to react during a crisis. Whereas others, as the Tylenol scare which also the book lists information on as an example on the other side of this is a way an organization should respond. Both those examples happened, you know, years ago, but they still stand out among public relations practitioners as examples of what not to do and, and what to do. So this chapter gives a very a nice overview on the different aspects of crisis communications, which is a pretty far-encompassing topic. I think a lot more time could have been spent on this on this chapter and it's one that is seems to be on the forefront in, in my colleagues is even in high in the world of, of higher education great example in higher education is um, <clears throat> the the Virginia Tech uh, shooting some years ago and how the university responded to that situation in terms of communicating the crisis and reaching out to students family members and and others who we want to know what was going on. Want to know what had happened to the to the victims. Um, in fact, the Virginia Tech incident is used as a case study from, and I've been to conferences where crisis communications has has come up. Someone Virginia Tech has presented. This is how we dealt with our really uh, tragic situation. So, it's an important one, and um, when when handled properly can mean a lot for the reputation of the organization as well as those who are affected by whatever the crisis is. When handled poorly, it creates a, it can have an impact that an organization can sometimes never recover from. So the first thing the book talks about is the idea of <coughs> excuse me of issues management, and that's kind of a forward thinking process where you're looking ahead to about one year down the road. What are some potential things coming up? Some issues coming up that we might have to defend our organization for, and how do we deal with them? There are largely external factors that are on the horizon. Um, say here in Alaska, you know, knowing a year out what the predicted, um, what's anticipated for the cost of oil per barrel going to be. You know, that can depend, depending on where you are and what type of industry, that can have an impact. That can create an issue for your organization, um, fiscally or otherwise. So it's getting that crystal ball out with the organization, looking down the road, saying these are things that could impact us. This is what we need to do to, um, to protect ourselves. Um, so again, it involves a lot of planning, a lot of forward thinking, and the PR people need to be at the table when identifying those uh, those issues. Um, then goes into the idea of risk communication, which is how um, how things are communicated during a, uh, a, a crisis situation, and what are some of the what are the who are some of the key stakeholders? What are some things we need to be uh, need to be focusing on, and the book talks about how during times of stress, um, pe about eighty percent of, of people's times is, is focused elsewhere. They have a hard time, you know, focusing in on you know what is happening at the time. So, knowing how to communicate to a rather distracted audience is kind of what risk communication is is all about. As far as managing a, uh, a crisis, uh, the book talks about what are some of the different things that happen when a crisis occurs. This includes um, surprise, because generally when a crisis occurs, it is, it's unexpected. Here's an example that just happened last week, and this wasn't necessarily a crisis, but it did require us at the university to put into effect some of our crisis communication plan, and that was when the freezing rain made most of the streets in Fairbanks pretty much um, uh, undrivable. So, when that occurred, when we realized, um, you know, on Monday that this was really creating a safety hazard for our students and employees, um, we put into the uh, management team got together, made a decision on what we were going to do in terms of canceling classes, in terms of closing the university down, with the exception of essential services. 
once we had that in place, we my department worked on the communications, um, getting the word out to um, students, staff, faculty, community members, um, etc. Using every communication platform we had at our at our disposal. So it was a surprise. We weren't okay. The weather forecast did call for freezing rain. I don't think anyone knew to what extent it would be or the effect it could have on business. So surprise is a big element. Um, insufficient information. People tend to speculate during a crisis, and now with online capabilities, bloggers, comments on the news miners section, um, people are making speculations and saying things that aren't necessarily the truth. Um, escalating events. As a crisis unfolds, things are happening sometimes at a rapid um, at a rapid pace. You have to be able to respond accordingly when those things happen. And more importantly, try to stay ahead of them as much as you can. Um, during a crisis, you can feel like loss of control, that you're you know, it's really kind of outside of your control as far as what's what's going on, and that tends to be a pretty frustrating experience. Increased outside scrutiny, people outside the organization who are looking and saying they need to be doing this, they need to be managing this differently. Um, a, a siege mentality um, kind of within the organization that we need to clam up, we need to not do anything. This comes usually from the legal the legal advisors who tend to have a different opinion on how to react during during a crisis. And then panic. People just kind of uh, forget to manage things in a logical manner, and sometimes panic sets in and the wrong decisions are made. Some of this, you know, even though crisis is an unexpected event, crises can be planned for. You can identify within your organization what are, and this kind of goes back to, to what issues management talks about, what are some potential crises we might have. Here at the university, we identify crises um, ranging from what would happen if we had an active shooter on campus to um, crises that are um, uh, occur because of what Mother Nature did. So you can plan for different crises, and you can have a communication plan in place for what's going to happen during crisis. Really, some of the main tips, though, for crisis planning is to uh, be prepared, be available, be credible, and act uh, appropriately. So this gets into where... Um, the author talks about communicating in a in a crisis and really the effective way to communicate during a crisis kind of goes back to some of these other concepts here for crisis planning is you want to be prompt you need to respond quickly when a crisis occurs because if you don't respond others are going to respond for you and going back to what I said about insufficient information given the lack of information with the organization people will come up with information themselves and they can get it out to others through social media, through blogs, through Twitter. And if that's the message that's going out first, that could be the believable message that people are getting. So you need to be prompt. You need to respond quickly. Um, you need to provide as much information as you can. And you need to be, uh, the information needs to be very frank and very honest. And um, just, and if there is, if it's a crisis situation where the organization is at fault, where a decision made by the organization has led to the crisis, that needs to be admitted, but on the same time, um, steps should be put into place that are going to kind of mitigate the uh, mitigate the situation. The the best friend or your worst friend during a crisis can be media. It can be your best friend because it can be a way to get information out to your public. But it can be your worst friend because that information um, could be inaccurate or could be sensationalized. Crisis coverage is an exciting one for, for journalists. It makes for great headlines and, and great uh, great art in terms of photos. And it's, it's news. It's very big news. So journalists aren't there to help your organization. They're there to report on what the news is. And you can make that news positive by making part of the story the way the organization is responding, what steps are being put into place to, like I said, to, to mitigate the, the factor. The, the book gives an overview of some different ways to deal with, with journalists from setting up um, uh, uh, a media area for them to report from during a time of a crisis to um, kind of lay out the ground rules of who's going to of who's going to be the spokesperson, et cetera. And really identifying a spokesperson during a crisis is important as well. That can go up to the top and be the CEO, um, depending on the crisis level of of how bad the crisis is or it can occur at the at the ground level with the public relations practitioner. So good chapter. Um, you know, I said pay close attention to this one. It's one that's on the forefront of PR practitioners in this day and age. And if you're looking to go into that industry, you know, having a textbook knowledge of it is going to be beneficial to you. All right. 
Uh, with that, we have one more chapter to go before we close up this semester. So um, hope this lecture was useful, and, and good luck out the quiz.